Welcome to Gold Creek. We're so glad that you're joining us online today. I'm Shauna Goodridge and I'm the Leadership Development Pastor here. If you're new to Gold Creek and you haven't let us know that you're here, make sure you fill out our new family form. And you can find that by just texting the word Gold Creek to the number on the screen. And for those of you already a part of our Gold Creek family, we are so thankful for you. And whether you've been contributing in this time with your time and your talents or with your resources, we just couldn't do church without you. So if you'd like to give for the first time and be a part of that effort, make sure you text GC Mill Creek to the number on your screen. Now let's get into service.
Hey, this is Pastor Dan, and I'm so glad you've joined us. We're in this series called Feast, and I'm so glad to have you here. If you're brand new with us, man, we want to know you. We want to get to know you. We want you to jot a note in the side margins. There are people there that are ready to talk to you, and we want you to get connected. I'm so excited to bring this message today. In fact, I'm, I've been thinking all day about this message called Feast. A lot of people have asked the question, why do a series on feasts? It's Old Testament. In fact, my wife and I were talking. We thought, man, for a new person that's never read the Bible or anything, you ask the question, what in the world are you in the Old Testament? What do these feasts have to do with me? And, and here's the cool thing. Every one of these feasts for the people of Israel in the Old Testament were a prophecy looking forward to what was going to happen. And it's the same for us. We can actually look at these feasts and discover something that God has done or is about to do. The other thing I really like about it is it's a, it's a party. They would have all these parties and every party pointed to Jesus. What a great way to think about Jesus. He's the center of a party and it's so true. Everywhere Jesus showed up, people wanted to be around him because he was a guy that people wanted to be around. I want you to think with me today. Um, there were three feasts out of seven. Now we've been talking about these feasts. We talked about all seven. Today's the last feast of the seven. It's actually called the Feast of Shelters. But there were three feasts that you were required to travel to Jerusalem for. And everybody in the whole country would come together for. There were three. So these three are more important than the other, uh, than the other feasts. And they're also kind of clustered together so you could travel and enjoy a little bit of each of the feasts. But I want you to think of these feasts and you'll understand why this last feast is so important. The first feast is this. It was the Passover. Everybody would go to the temple and there would be a lamb slain. There would be blood put on the doorpost. And of course, that's a picture of what would happen to Jesus. In fact, it was on the feast of Passover that Jesus would die on the cross. On that Friday that they would be celebrating Passover, Jesus died so that our sins would be forgiven. And every time you take communion, it's a reminder of Passover. And then there's the Feast of Pentecost. Pastor Jason talked about it a little bit, which is really about the Holy Spirit. In fact, 50 days, 50 days after the Passover is the Feast of Pentecost. And it was 50 days after Jesus died on the cross that the Holy Spirit showed up in such a huge way. And it was such a difference maker. And here's the, here's the interesting thing. It predicted something that, that people didn't really think about. The Holy Spirit is the reason we can live differently. Up until that point, we're trying to live on our own, we're doing it in our own strength, but when the Holy Spirit fills you and, and is a part of your life, it's such a difference maker. And so everyone would get together and they celebrate the Pentecost. Passover, Pentecost. Passover, Jesus, Pentecost, Holy Spirit. So who's the third? It's this one, it's called the Feast of Shelters. And the way I look at this is they would get together. And the reason I stepped out of a tent right now is because that's what they would do. They would set up these temporary shelters and all go live in these shelters. What did that point to? It points to something that is yet to happen. It points to something in our life that's yet to happen. And that is the Heavenly Father's home. We call it heaven. Today, by the end of this service, by the end of this sermon, my hope is that you will have some of your questions answered about heaven. And if you have more questions, I'd love to field some of your questions. I always love the questions. When I get around kids, they like to talk about heaven and they like to ask questions about heaven. I hope you, by the end of this message, understand a little bit more about heaven. Because this feast, the Feast of Shelters, is all about heaven. In fact, I don't want to call it the Feast of Shelters because we don't kind of understand it. They were, they, that's what they called it. I'm going to call it the Feast of Tenting. So here's what it was about. The first thing that was required is that everyone would travel to Jerusalem and that everyone in Jerusalem would leave their house. And there was an edict that said, everybody has to camp for seven days. Man, would I love that. I, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, I would really love to mess with everybody to say, all right, everybody, you can't go home. You've got to go grab a tent and for seven days, 
you have to camp. What if we did that? What do you think would happen? How many people would hate it? In fact, if you're in a car right now or, or if you're uh, at the couch or you're sitting next to somebody and just answer the question, would you hate it? And I asked the question, how many of them would love it? Now, I'm, I'm telling you, our family goes away and it feels like heaven to me when we go for seven days and we camp, we don't have running water and we don't have bathrooms, we don't have fresh water, we boil our water. We live in a tent for seven days on a beach and it's heaven. So for me, I'm gonna tell you, I would love it, but I would also love watching those who hate it. So can you imagine what this feast was like? Full of people who hate it and love it all at the same time. It's no different, we're no different. That's what it would have been like. And then I asked the question, how many would rebel? They would just try and get around that rule or just be out of the country at the time or try and get away from it. I, many of you would rebel, I'm pretty sure that's the truth. But I asked the question, if you really had to camp for seven days, what would you learn? In fact, what do you learn when you go camping now? You know, I, I, I'm gonna throw you some pictures out there that kind of show you what you learn. Here's the first thing you learn when you go camping. You have to have a place to go. Now this picture um, is a place to go, which in, in my mind is kind of creative, actually pretty uh, amazing. Uh, a little less privacy than I prefer and a little too close to my tent, in my opinion, but you gotta have a place to go, that's what you learn. The second thing is you gotta learn to prepare for rain. This guy's obviously prepared for rain. The third thing is you gotta learn you don't wanna park too close to the water because it could get you in trouble. The fourth thing you gotta learn is you gotta learn how to cook. You gotta creatively figure out how to cook differently than you did before. And the fifth thing is that when you go and if you decide to do something other than a tent like a camper, make sure your truck can really handle the camper. Well, as we thought just for a minute or two about what you can learn from camping, let's learn the real reason why God required the people of Israel to do this. Leviticus 23 tells us the regulations. It says this, the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Begin celebrating the festival of shelters on the 15th day of the appointed month, five days after the day of atonement. This festival or this feast to the Lord will last for seven days. Now here's the catcher. For seven days, you must live outside in little shelters. Man, I, I just think it'd be really fun to see what happened on that day. In fact, I think if I could go to Israel at any time, I'd love to be there at this time when you could see people living outside their home. And it goes on and says this, all native born Israelites must live in shelters. This will be, and now here's the reason. In verse 43, this will remind each new generation, in fact, I underlined that, and you can look at that on the screen there. I underlined this. Each new generation of Israelites that I have made their ancestors live in shelters when I rescued them from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So now we begin to understand why he did this. This is not for the generation that existed. This is for the next generation. This is about the kids. This is about young people learning something. What are they gonna learn? How are they gonna learn it? And in fact, today, this lesson is just as real for us today because this feast of shelters is a prophecy for us to learn from. And I get it. When I go camping, I love to take kids camping. For 25 years, I've taken kids fly fishing and we, we did dads and kids trip and it was awesome. And then um, during those high school years with my daughter, I was trying to find a way to connect with her in a more meaningful way that, that as a dad I could do. And I remember the one thing that connected us is that every year we would take long trips together and I would teach her how to backpack, how to live in the woods, how to hike in steep places. And, 
we bonded in such a meaningful way. There was some stuff that I was able to pass on to my daughter that I couldn't pass on any other time, and it built her confidence. There's some stuff to learn today for our next generation. So even as you're listening, I want you to think, if you are a person of faith, one of the things that you can recognize today is there's going to be a lesson for something you to pass on to your next generation. And also today, even in your own life, to think about this is something yet to come. And you know what it represents? It represents heaven. It re rep represents the heavenly father, his home that is not temporary. We live in something temporary so that we remember that there's a permanent home that we get to go to in the future that will make such a huge difference. So what is it that we believe about heaven? In fact, I ask you the question, do you even believe in heaven? I want to remind the next generation that this is not our permanent home. So let's think about what we learn when you go camping. When you think about living in shelters, when we think about this feast, here's what you learn. You know what you learn? We love our luxuries. We really love our luxuries. If we were forced to live outside of our house, you know what we'd first miss? Running water. Uh, besides the river running, we want, we want pure water. We want, we want our water that we don't have to do anything with. And then not only do we want pure water, we want it heated up. So when we take a shower in the morning, it's already hot. Some of you can't live without a hot shower. I know who you are. And then at night, you know what? If it's a little cold, you want to turn the temperature up. And if it's a little bit hot, you want to turn your air conditioning on. We love our luxuries. And we can't go an evening without sitting down watching TV, watching the news. And if we don't even have television, we're always on the internet. We love our luxuries. You know what else we learn? We love our houses or our apartments. Uh, we all have our closets, our bedrooms, our garages, our dining rooms, and it just feels like home. When you've been away for a while, you come home, you go, wow, I just love my home. I love this place. And you know what else? We love our stuff. When you walk into my house, what you'll discover is that my wife loves her stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I love her stuff because she loves to decorate. She's got furniture that she's thought about way too long, way, way more than I ever thought about. And she's bought and sold pieces and every piece has a, it's just all this stuff and you walk in, but you know what? You don't have to walk into the house to find my stuff. You know where you find my stuff? In the garage. Don't mess with the garage. I have, I have all my stuff in the garage and it's all laid out. We all have our stuff, our furniture, our cars, our clothes, our stuff, and we love our stuff. Here's what happens when you live temporary. You can't take your stuff with you. You just can't do it. Let me illustrate that for you. I am. Um, I brought with me um, a backpack. This backpack right here is, um, is 10 days worth of camping. It weighs about 48 pounds. Uh, it doesn't have the tent on it yet. I'm, I'm going to have some other stuff I carry. So between 50 and 60 pounds I'll be carrying on my back for 10 days. In the middle of August, I'm going to go away for 10 days. And that's what this represents. And when you're, when you're carrying around and living temporarily, you can't take all your stuff with you. You know, the festival, the Feast of Tents, or the Feast of, um, the Feast of Tents, or the Feast of, of uh, what they call it, uh, shelters, is, is a reminder that this is not our permanent home. So let's talk about our permanent home. What is this pointing to? One day, we're going to go to our Heavenly Father's house. In fact, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Here's what we know about heaven. Heaven is actually a real place. In fact, Jesus is preparing a house for me that has me in mind. My wife and I built a cabin, and we love our cabin because we built it the way we wanted it. Can you imagine the God of universe who knows us and knows what we're like, knows all of our life, has prepared something that will best fit me. And when I show up in heaven, there's a place that's going to feel so much like home. I'm going to love my new place. 
you're going to love your new place. And we're going to love our new stuff. Some of you think, well, we can't take it with us. That's true. The stuff we have on earth is nothing. All the stuff we have doesn't amount to anything. When we get to heaven, the new stuff we get, I can't, I can't wait to see the clothes that I wear, the furniture that I have, the stuff that, that is new stuff, stuff that I haven't even thought about. I can't wait in heaven to see the stuff. And I am going to love our new world. You know, it's interesting. When heaven is described, the capital of, of heaven is Jerusalem. They call it the new Jerusalem. It is uh, 1,400 miles cubed. And everyone that's ever had faith in God can live in heaven. In fact, there's a place for them in heaven. So 1,400 miles is like the center of the United States, 1,400 miles square. Like, you know, just the very center without the East Coast and West Coast, which wouldn't hurt to leave them off anyway. But anyway, anyway that, that, you could throw that out if you want to. But anyway, so here's this 1,400 miles, 1,400 miles, and it's 1,400 miles high. 1,400 miles high. Now think about that. 1,400 miles high represents these different layers, and we can't even imagine what we can't imagine as how God's provided the transportation, how God's going to build the levels, all the different things. This city is going to be unlike any other city you've ever explored. And if you're a city person, you're going to spend eternity figuring out where next to go in the city, because this is going to be an incredible city. But if you're an outside person, like I am, and you love the wilderness, you can step outside of that city. And the Bible says that he's creating a brand new world, unspoiled wilderness that we can spend an eternity exploring. I can't wait. If, if God did a really good job, and the Bible says he said it was good. If God did a really good job with our wilderness, with our creation, can you ha imagine what he's going to do with the next creation? I can't wait to see the new world that God's provided. And when we tent, when we celebrate the festival of tents, we're reminded of that. In fact, Colossians says this, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, here's what it says, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. When we teach our kids and we go camping, it's a reminder today there's something permanent that's so much better than what we have. And at the center of that permanency is God, the Heavenly Father, and His Son, who made it possible for us to be there. There's another thing we need to remind our next generation, and that's about our body. This is not our permanent body. When you go to heaven, whatever you think, this body right here that we have is just temporary. Um, and how do we know it's temporary? Well, you can know it's temporary because uh, our health. We all love our health. We always love to be healthy. But the problem is that we're not always healthy. We face all kinds of things. When, just a few weeks ago, when I went camping, first thing that happened is I thought I got bit by a black widow spider. Instead, what I discovered is I had shingles. And for three weeks, I had incredible pain and stuff in the middle of my camping trip. And I was reminded that this body that I have is rebelling. It's just hard. It's just not, it's not made. In fact, the older you get, the more you begin to realize that your body is made to die. And someday, we will get sick and die. Someday, our body will go back to dust. The coronavirus is, a, is giving us a perspective in a new way. All across the world, all, all across the country, people are, are thinking about life and death issues. And maybe you're here today and you're watching and you go, man, I'm afraid to die. That's why I don't want to get the coronavirus because what if it kills me? But there's a new perspective. When, you, when you've celebrated the Festival of Tents, when you've celebrated the Festival of, uh, of the Feast of, of Shelters, what you begin to realize is that there's something more to life than just our body, that this 
death that we experience is a step to another life, that something is going to take us there. And it's interesting. I, I experience this all the time. As a chaplain, I get called out to uh, families who, are, who have just lost somebody. And just last week, I was called out to a family, and there was this German grandma that had just died, and she was just, just shriveled away, and they talked to me about what she was going through, and and how she died, and, and they just found her, and they all got together. But here's the one thing that they told me about her. They said, she was a Christian. In fact, they said, she's a Lutheran. <laughs> and she goes, we want a pastor to pray, and we want to give her to God, because we know she's going to heaven. You know, I, I, what a great message. I gathered around, I grabbed the hands of those kids, and some of those kids didn't have any faith in God whatsoever, but they wanted to respect the faith of their grandmother. That grandmother was passing on to them a vision of heaven, and in that prayer, I began to just talk about all the things that that grandma was looking forward to, that that new body that she had. And what do we know about the Bible, uh, the body, the new body that we have? We know this, that when we're raised in new life and God gives us a new body, um, we're going to be able to eat and not gain weight. That's a pretty cool thing. I, I think we'll still get hungry, but we also know that the very first thing we do is we're going to be invited to this great big dinner with all of our friends and family that we've been missing. And it's going to be such a great time. It's just a reminder. Um, we're not going to need uh, a night light because Jesus and God himself will be the light. Uh, will we sleep? It's possible that you can sleep, but you don't have to sleep. But I don't know about you, getting a little sleep is not a bad thing. I love a great night's rest. So here's the thing. This new body is going to have very different characteristics. It will be eternal. It will not be able to be killed. And it will have a whole different. Once some people ask the question, will I be able to recognize my loved one, my friends, my grandma, my child, my baby? What will happen to that baby that that died early and makes it to heaven. I, I, I was thinking about that. There's a lot of different theories and ideas, but I, I thought the best one that I have is that if, if you get to heaven and you had a baby that has gone on before you, think about this. I believe that you'll recognize this little child, but also you'll recognize that this little child gets to grow up in heaven. You can't think of a better place to grow up than heaven. We're going to recognize our loved ones, our friends, the people that have gone on before us. Heaven is a place full of the people that I love and that love me. Second Corinthians says this, we know that when this earthly tent that we live in is taken down, catch that? Festival of shelters, the feast of shelters, this earthly tent that we live in, that is that when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothes for we will put on heavenly bodies and we will not be spirits without bodies. Man, I love this. We know that we know we're gonna have an eternal body. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that close us. Rather, we want to put on the new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. There's another thing to remind the next generation. And that's really what the Festival of Shelters reminded them that they were on the journey to the promised land. They, they were looking back at their ancestors that made a journey to the promised land, but we're also on a journey to the promised land. That promised land is the heavenly father's home. It's the home that's prepared for me. And heaven's that place. A lot of people ask the question, are there gonna be animals in heaven? And I have a great answer for you, absolutely. What do we know? We know there's going to be a lion and a lamb. We know there's going to be horses. There's all kinds of animals. And I can't wait to see the new kind of animals that God creates because he's created some weird ones here now. And I can't wait to see what God creates. And, and I, I was uh, just the other day with my uh, grandson who loves to fish. And we were out fishing and we were talking about heaven. And, 
And one of the things that, that he said is, he says, I don't want to go to heaven because there's no fishing in heaven. I said, you're wrong, Roman. There's four rivers that run through the city and there has to be fish in those rivers. And we're going to fish them together, you and I. This new creation, wow. We get to explore this creation. This promised land, this new world is better than the first. I hope that I've helped you think about heaven. But the real question is, how are we going to know that we're going there? It's, it's interesting. When Barna asked the question, do you believe in heaven? Almost 80% of the country said, I believe in heaven. When they asked whether you're going to make it there, some of them were honest and said they didn't think they were going to make it. But it was like 70% out of the 80% said, yeah, we're making it. And I, I was thinking, what do they base that on? What do you base it on? You believe in heaven, you think you're going to make it just because you think God's a loving God. Here's what Jesus said. He said, the road's narrow. It's it's a narrow road. Not very many people find it. The highway's wide that leads to destruction. But today, I want you to know that road is for you to find, for you to take. It's not that it's hard to find. It's hard to travel. In fact, I I think I like to say this. It's easy to join the journey. It's easy to be on the pathway to the promised land. It's just a hard path once you're on that path. First Peter says this. Remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents, as foreigners, keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. You know what I want you to do? I want you to remind the next generation there's more to life than just what's here. The next time you go tenting, you be reminded that this is a spiritual battle and that there's a spiritual war going on for your soul. And how do you handle that battle? Well, Jesus came to rescue us. That's why we celebrate the Passover. When we take the cup and the juice, we're reminded that he forgives our sins. And then we celebrate the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes to give us the power to take that narrow wet road and live differently. And then we're reminded today that the Father is waiting for us for the moment that we step from this life into the next life, we find our real home. You know, I'm reminded today that some of you, after listening to this, are unsure of your own personal uh, decision, whether you've really followed Jesus Christ. I want to invite you right now to make a decision to follow Jesus. Would you bow your heads? With your heads bowed, I just want you to, to think for a moment of what these feasts have been all about. The Passover is the day that you recognize that you have sin in your life and it needs to be forgiven. And that Jesus died so that you would not die spiritually. And he loves you and wants to step into your life. So with your heads bowed, it's as simple as this. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I accept you. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And even as you prayed that, I want you to think about the next step. I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to help you live with power in your life, to live differently. And just invite the Holy Spirit into your life right now. Holy Spirit, be the difference maker in me. And then one last thing, I want you to picture the day that you will step from this life into the next life. And I want you to see it in your mind's eye and be reminded of your permanent home. Thank you, Lord, for preparing a place for me, for us. If you prayed that prayer, 
If you have that vision in your mind, if you want to be a part of that, we want to help you in that journey. I want you to do something. I just want you to text, I'm in. And there's, it'll be right on that screen there. There's a number that you text to and just type in the words, I am in. And we're going to respond to you. We want to help you in that journey. And if you're really thinking about that journey and you wonder about that journey, we have a class that we're going to do that's called the Alpha Class that will help you begin to think about what you believe and how you can believe and how you can have a faith in Jesus Christ. If you're still at the beginning of your journey, that's a great class for you to start in. All you need to do is let us know that you want to be a part of that class as well. And if you'll type, I'm in, we'll invite you to that class as well. Well, as we close out this service, I want to challenge you to do one more thing. This whole thing is about passing on your faith to the next generation. So around your table, in your car, at your campsite, wherever you are, what I want you to do right now is I want you to have these discussion questions and ask this question to each other. What are you excited about heaven? How do you know you're going there? And who do you most want to see? I can't wait to hear some of the results of your discussions. And I can't wait to see you next week when we start the brand new series called Big Fish. Thanks for being a part of our Gold Creek online community. We are so glad to have you with us today. To make sure you're up to date about everything Gold Creek, download our app, head to our website, and follow us on social media. We'll see you soon.